Welcome to Decarbonizing Commerce, where we explore what's new, interesting, and actionable at the intersection of climate innovation and commerce. I'm your host, Keith Anderson, and together we'll meet entrepreneurs and innovators reinventing retail, e-commerce, and consumer products through the lenses of low carbon and commercial viability. Hi, everyone. I'm Keith Anderson, and this is the Decarbonizing Commerce podcast. And our topic today is decarbonizing media and advertising with our guest, Ann Coughlin, co-founder and chief operating officer of Scope3. Scope3 is building a pioneering platform to help the advertising and media ecosystem measure and collaborate to drive down emissions. Uh, and Anne, before co-founding the company, was head of product at a company called Waybridge, which helped uh, make the supply chain for raw materials more efficient, resilient, and sustainable. And her background prior to that was really in product leadership roles in the ad tech landscape. Anne is also a uh, part of the ad age 40 under 40 list. And before meeting Ann and getting to know scope three, I didn't understand the size of the emissions challenge in advertising and media or what drove it or what the industry can and is doing to collaborate to reduce emissions. But I learned a lot speaking with Ann and I think you will too. So I'd love to introduce you to Ann Coughlin of Scope3. Hi, Ann. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Well, it's great to finally meet you and speak with you. And I have to congratulate you and the company on the name and especially the domain name. Yeah, it was a bit of a coup, I think, to get Scope3.com. And certainly something that we were quite proud of to be able to name our company after a whole a whole problem, a whole category of um, the greenhouse gas protocol and really shining a light on the need to focus on supply chain emissions. Well, that may be a great place to start. Uh, I think many in the audience are familiar with what the the three scopes are and uh, what they mean, but maybe you can spend a minute or two uh, defining them and explaining why it was such a focus for you and your co-founders. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and also, I love the fact that we're starting with some definitions that make sure that um, that we get we get those covered off at the, at the start. So, scope one, uh, scope two, and scope three emissions are the different categories within the greenhouse gas protocol as to how we talk about the uh, greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere by you know as a result of doing business. Scope one emissions are direct emissions, so the emissions that you have full control over, um, and in you know physical. Uh, manufacturing companies, for example, that's, you know, as a byproduct of the processing that you do. Um, scope two emissions are indirect emissions from, you know, generating power, heating your offices, that kind of thing. Um, and scope three, which is where most emissions come from, are the emissions of your supply chain. There are multiple categories under that, things like business travel, employee commuting, goods and services, all of these fall under scope three. For many companies, scope three emissions can be um, almost all of the emissions um, of a company. Uh, Our company, we don't have any scope one emissions at all. Um, We don't own anything. We don't generate stuff. And so really almost everything is scope three. And so by focusing on where emissions are coming from in this interconnected world of of industry, uh, that's where we can really focus on how we, we help um, the, an industry decarbonize. And at Scope 3, we're really focused on the, the advertising industry. That was going to be my next question. You know, we're not talking about the supply chain broadly. We're talking about advertising. Uh, how big of a source of emissions is the ad ecosystem? And h- how did you and your co-founders end up deciding to start the business? So I'll take the second half of that question first, and then I can talk about how big advertising is. So uh, myself and my co-founders, we've been working in advertising for a really long time and specifically in digital advertising. Um, I think it's interesting to think about uh, the fact that that no one really 
uh, considers digital to have a carbon footprint. I think when we think about emissions um, as you know individuals, as humans, as consumers, we think about and can relate more to this idea of something physical having a carbon footprint. So you know you can see the entrails of an aeroplane in the sky. You know that you put petrol or gasoline in your car. Like these things are really tangible and real. And so thinking about the digital advertising ecosystem can sometimes be you know, a little strange to think about something so ephemeral and fluffy like a cloud actually being server farms being powered by electricity. So like the company was kind of started because we'd been working in emissions, sorry, we've been working in advertising for a really long time. And then we actually, um, the co-founding team were working outside of uh, advertising with physical supply chain companies. So companies that were buying and selling metal and transporting that around the world, trying to understand and model how we could help those companies be more efficient, more resilient, more ultimately sustainable, and recognizing that all of the physical um, connectivity, all of the modeling and mapping that we were doing could potentially also translate back into the advertising ecosystem, where we started to realize that there was actually a really large carbon footprint because of all of the electricity being used to um, to power this entire advertising ecosystem. To give you a, a, an idea of the scale and size of that problem, it's quite hard to put an exact number on it. You think about the, the number of servers that power the internet. I think some estimates are say that the internet's about 4% of global uh, energy consumption. Um, that is um, significantly powered by advertising, like advertising powers and funds the largest um, companies in the world, like the alphabets, the metas of, uh, you know, the X's of this world um, okay. are all, you know, funded by advertising. And so there's a huge, um, a huge part of um, emissions coming from the internet that is actually this complexity of how ads are uh, delivered um, how creatives or the ads, ads, ads are um, are made, and and that's pretty big and quite striking. Yeah, I, I can imagine, and I, I totally understand your point about uh, digital emissions being sort of viewed as abstract. Uh, it was certainly one of the areas that I hadn't really paid much attention to until I started discovering businesses like yours, companies focusing on ways of. Uh, decarbonizing cloud computing or cloud storage. And and the big one that I think has been in the headlines over the last several months is the emissions and, and water intensity of AI. Absolutely. I mean, as you, as you look at some of the disclosures from Alphabet and uh, Microsoft, as they've invested so heavily in generative AI, the processing is uh, really driving resource intensity up. Absolutely. And I think it's that um, lack of realization that with these new innovations, you need to have a, you know, have a second eye on the environmental impact of those innovations. I think, you know, when I started in the advertising industry many years ago, and really focusing on programmatic advertising, um, I mean, it was so far from my mind. I didn't think about the environmental impact at all. Um, I was just caring about trying to make the internet a bit better by making sure that good publishers were um, making money from quality advertising and that users and potential consumers of brands were um, being found and being shown the right ad for them did not think about the fact that for every single ad that is served online, there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of companies touching that transaction. All of the auctions that happen, all of the different computers that or servers that get spun up just to do a tiny bit of computation um, is, is, is kind of mind boggling when you think about it. Um, had no idea 10 years ago. But now we're in a position where as these new innovations happen, we can think about some of those second order consequences and realize that we should be asking those questions about 
what are the business benefits, but also what are the um, environmental considerations that we should be doing to make sure that we're not, you know, in five years time talking about how you know everyone's carbon emissions have gone through the roof just because the number of servers that we've had to bring online to support the weight of this, um, where ultimately they're not necessarily dramatically improving a business KPI. You and the company have published what I thought was a really enlightening report on the state of uh, ad industry emissions. And maybe it would be helpful, especially for those that haven't read it, just to take a minute and uh, unpack the ad ecosystem and where some of the hot spots are. You, you sort of set part of it up by introducing how many players uh, touch an ad through the whole life cycle. But I think it would be really helpful to understand uh, with what does the ecosystem look like and where are some of the levers that different players in the ecosystem can pull to move the needle. And then I, I don't want to jump into it right away, but I would love to go from there to, okay, if we then came back to the business considerations, uh, where have we found there's actually win-wins uh, in terms of we can pull some of those levers and it actually saves us cost or increases effectiveness? Yeah. Um, so we've released two reports to date trying to map out the state of sustainable advertising within the digital ecosystem. The kind of headline number in the most recent report that we released, which looked at uh, 30 different countries, looked at um, the kind of display uh, inventory, as well as streaming video inventory, um, showed that there is 7.2 million metric tons um, of CO2E um, being emitted on an annual basis. That is a lot. Um, that is, uh, you know, uh, 400, uh, more than 400 swimming pools of petrol that you would need to, um, to burn essentially. So significant wow. amount of, of carbon going into the atmosphere there. Um, and where we see the most amount of emissions coming from, is what we define to be the ad selection process. So if you think about those scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, and you think about it from the start of a, of a product, which is the publisher trying to sell ad space to a brand, you start with the publisher. Their scope three are all of the companies that are involved in deciding which ad gets shown. Um, and within, you know, Programmatic advertising, they'll be working with tens, but sometimes hundreds of supply side partners who talk to each other, who then also talk to um, the demand side pl pl uh, platforms as well. So this is kind of real complex web of all of the different players. And each one of those essentially like nodes in this um, graph um, also obviously have their own corporate emissions as well. So kind of adding in their kind of scope one and two into this, this picture. Um, and so what we see is that ad selection process has a significant amount of waste um, and redundancy. Um, we see the same players being called multiple times. So it's not just a, uh, a linear supply chain. It's almost like a, in some cases, a circular returning supply chain, this kind of complexity that um, I certainly wouldn't be able to justify having one of those if I was a publisher from a revenue perspective, um, because it is, seems to me to be so convoluted and so complex. Um, so what we see there is like a real lever in um, understanding that all of that from an emissions perspective is bad, not also great from a understanding where your revenue is coming from and how to maximize that um, too. So that's where we see kind of a significant um significant amount of opportunity from a reducing waste perspective. Um, and so we recognize that across the ecosystem, there are different pockets of publishers that are doing really well from an emissions perspective, often because they've had uh, 
business goals that have been quite aligned to being more sustainable. Even things like you care about your user experience. If you have 20 ads on a page and each one of those is, you know, behind that is that huge, crazy web that I just talked about, that's kind of going to be bad from a user experience perspective of number of ads that are there, but also potentially page loading. And, you know, you can sometimes feel your phone or your laptop heating up based on the amount of energy being used to actually load the site in the end. Um, we also see um, uh, significant differences on the creative side. So the actual creative asset, of course, a video asset is going to be um, more uh, energy intensive uh, than a, a kind of a standard banner. But lots of things that can be done there. Lots of really interesting companies in the space, like a company called uh, Seen This, who um, enables you to stream a creative rather than download the full asset at the beginning, which is great from a user perspective as well. So kind of lots of different um, ways of thinking about the waste reduction, not just from a um, carbon emissions point of view, but also from an ultimately uh, a performance perspective as well. Yeah. And, and is waste reduction the primary lever that can be pulled? I think from a publisher perspective, there is definitely this kind of looking at two axes, one being, one being revenue opportunity and one being um, emissions. I think there is a, uh, a really simple um, framing for brands when looking across the channels and across the media that they're buying as to what actual uh, slices of inventory are as on the whole um, wasteful. So, you know, a site that's high emissions versus a site that's low emissions, fine. A site that's high emissions could, you know, do some of their own um, optimizations to be less wasteful themselves. But even in kind of the more binary, like, do I buy this site or not? Lots of things to be done from a brand perspective where uh, we've been running um, studies to show that they see better performance on pockets of inventory that are just generally higher value and lower emissions. Got it. So I think we've done a great job framing the problem. Why don't we shift into what scope three itself does uh, and how do you do it? Who do you work with and so on? Yeah. So we started the company by thinking about how we actually can map and model the sources of all these missions. So kind of those buckets that I talked about, the ways of uh, being able to optimize to do that, you first need the measurement data. You first need to actually be able to build out the model, the methodology to be able to get to numbers that can actually be actionable. So we, um, in the physical world, we talk a lot about building a digital twin. So you take a process, you take, you know, shipping routes, and you take the way that different companies work together and you build this kind of digital model of that so that you can play around and understand, you know, what, if you did X, like what would the impact be? If you did Y, what would the impact be? So we were essentially building a digital twin of a digital ecosystem. Um, and we um, open sourced our methodology last year and essentially provide to all players within the advertising ecosystem the opportunity to use the output of our model. So to use our data set um, to understand what they can then do from a reduction perspective. Um, we also um, work with many players to offer up solutions. So our theory is that by providing uh, solutions that are more sustainable for brands or agencies to buy, spend will shift towards greener, more decarbon, like uh, inventory that's more on the journey of decarbon towards decarbonization. And that will encourage everyone in the ecosystem to essentially be on the race to the bottom and the only time I will ever say that a race to the bottom is a good thing uh, when we're talking about uh, carbon emissions. So we provide kind of those solutions as well. And really what we're doing is we are building what we're calling a collaborative sustainability platform. So this idea that all of the data across the ecosystem needs to be 
able to be uh, kind of centralized and collaborated on in order to make sure that we're all talking the same language, we're all tracking towards decarbonization together, we're finding and creating an ecosystem of solutions that, again, drives that decarbonization. Um, and we're doing that in such a way that um, we're reflecting the connectedness of the ecosystem without um, without putting sustainability to the side. So essentially bringing sustainability into the center of the conversation when we're talking about media outcomes. And so you've tried to do that, as you say, through measurement and introducing some new KPIs. W what are the new KPIs that you're pioneering? So the first KPI that we've introduced in our reports is GCO2 PM. Really rolls off the tongue. We love KPIs. How many letters can we get into one? It's really the grams of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalents per a thousand impressions. So this is just a really good measure to start to understand and be able to compare um, kind of value of inventory, but with a focus and a lens on carbon. So the lower the GCO2 PM, the um, more carbon efficient uh, a domain is or an app or a connected TV device or a digital out of home screen or whatever, you can start to really compare um, across channels, etc. We have um, partnerships with um, other companies also focusing on media quality and seeing a correlation between low emissions and you know, other performance metrics. So uh, KPIs like the um, carbon cost per attentive second. Um, none of these roll off the tongue. I think what we're, what we're seeing is that by including carbon alongside any existing media KPI, you're starting to see this nuance that by focusing on um, carbon numbers alongside whether it's a CPA goal or your return on ad spend, you can start to see different trends and start to recognize where maybe where there are um, areas of your media plan that benefits even more from focusing on carbon emissions. So am I correct then that the primary user would be the media buyers? We have um, lots of media buyers using our data um, via channels to start to make decisions. Um, absolutely. I think media investment teams also um, are using our data to kind of understand more holistically where there should be um, broad investment um, into uh, inventory, again, from a carbon lens. But yes, media buyers definitely focusing on um, how to make buying more sustainable um, and essentially adding another axis to the um, the decisions that they've been making before. So spoke with one uh, media buyer last week who essentially says that he takes our data on a carbon emissions perspective, overlays that with the primary KPI, works out what's high emissions and high performance, Okay, we need to lower emissions or maybe move spend slightly away from that because there's a bit of a trade-off there. If it's low emissions and high performance, like let's go, <laughs> let's put a rocket ship. Um, and then if it's you know high emissions, low performance, it's a no-brainer to, to cut that from, the, from the plan. Well, and, and that was directionally where I was headed next, which was how is the industry beginning to align and integrate some of your data with those conventional performance data sets? Is it happening at the moment just based on the stage of maturity through innovators like entrepreneurs who are exporting data from your platform and merging it with data they already have? Or how is that coming to life? I think we're starting to see it. So our data is now alongside, you know, uh, performance data in a variety of different um, verification uh, platforms. So Double Verify, IAS, Ubiquity, all have, many others all have 
um, you know, essentially an emissions column that enables you to start looking at these things side by side. I will definitely say that this is not a primary KPI and nor will it ever be a primary KPI. But I think we're definitely seeing, especially with some of the more innovative, forward-looking brands that have ESG goals front and center within their organization, prioritizing sustainability and, and kind of prioritizing carbon reduction within their plans as something that, you know, is very close to um, the the primary goals of, of whatever they're trying to, to achieve. Can you name names? And if not, uh, you know, if, can, can you at least profile what some of those innovative companies look like in terms of commitments and uh, really what it looks like to lead? So uh, kind of zooming out from media and advertising just for a second, um, I'm from the UK, so I'm biased, but um, 81% of the top 100 UK companies have some sort of net zero goal. But that's scope one, scope two, usually scope one, scope two is 2030. And then scope three is a little bit beyond that. And that's trickling down into the uh, marketing departments, right, from, from the CEO's office. And what we see is... Um, for many large companies, particularly FMCG brands, where there has been a, such a big focus on how they decarbonize their physical supply chains, right? How they decarbonize their manufacturing, how they you know, make their products um, lower emissions overall. When there's been a focus there, the marketing department feels like they, there's, they need to do something and they're Um, focusing on uh, what they can do across their media planning. And digital can be a significant portion of that. So I think um, MasterCard um, said recently on stage that half of their spend in marketing goes to digital, but 80% of the emissions come from digital. So there is an opportunity there. And we see forward-thinking brands recognizing this and lowering their um, their footprint, it becomes a higher priority. Um, and if they can get good performance, then it feels like it's more of a no-brainer. It's a kind of a, a double win. Um, we did work with some brands uh, through a pilot with the WFA earlier this year. So, um, Reckitt, Mastercard, Philips, Diageo were part of that, um, and we saw this testing around reducing emissions and whether that should be um, good for performance as well, kind of come to life and and be realized. And so those sorts of brands really kind of leaning in. Um, But we see case studies coming out from some of our partners where our partners are using our data to help brands optimize. So Adform uh, DSP has been doing some case studies. I think they released one recently with Vodafone, with Audi. So we're seeing kind of brands in multiple different verticals looking at this and and recognizing that there can actually be quick wins within their marketing departments because something like, I know, changing your factory and, you know, reducing your water usage if you're uh, an alcohol brand and making, you know, everyone commute in a different way is a lot harder than making some configuration tweaks that you can see the progress and the results month over month. Yeah, I, I'm seeing really similar. And I, I think historically, so much of the action has been really originated by sustainability teams. And naturally, to your point, their focus is on energy and transportation and the macro drivers of a company's scope one and two emissions. Uh, where I see things headed and what I think is so interesting and what we're really focused on is uh, in all these conventional functions and disciplines, uh, you know, you may as a marketer not be responsible for energy or transportation choices, but within your 
uh, remit, you can reduce emissions uh, strategically. And, and at least for the foreseeable future, there's typically that low hanging fruit that you have highlighted. That is you, you can recover waste or you can improve experience or effectiveness uh, with new data that helps you pinpoint here's where the, the sweet spot is. And I think in some distant point in the future, we're going to have to make even harder uh, choices and it's not going to be uh, quite so straightforward to win-win. But I think what's uh, opening a lot of people's minds at the moment is with data like this, they can start to add a new layer to their analysis. And when you can do that, you can see, oh, this is something that's just a sensible decision any way you look at it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think, yeah, we, you always know that if you're if you're starting from a relatively high number to get to the average, uh, if you are talking about benchmarks, it, it's maybe not that much of a work to do. Um, and that's really hopeful and promising that we can actually dramatically reduce at the beginning. You're totally right that probably in a couple of years' time, getting that last mile, that last hurdle is always the, the most difficult part. But we actually ran, again, can't name the brand but um, specifically, but we ran a test where the average emissions across this brand's campaign were already below the kind of the the median for that specific country so they were already starting from a a place of you know being better um and they still managed to over the course of the campaign to reduce their carbon emissions by nine percent and performance improved so what that shows is that even if you're actually on the journey and you've already been kind of putting best practices in place without even realizing potentially that there was this positive effect, there is still jobs to be done and there is still work that you can do to further enhance. So I think that gives me hope as well that um, there are things that can be done from a low hanging fruit perspective, to, to use your words, but also when you're already operating your marketing department with significant best practices, with, you know, really good hygiene on all of the other areas of um, what it takes to run an effective media campaign, you can still do better from an emissions perspective and it's not going to hurt. Absolutely. And I mean, that, that makes me think about some of the, adjacent or intersecting potential emissions drivers uh, within media and advertising. Uh, how do you think about and what are you seeing in areas that maybe scope three itself doesn't directly touch, but what other ways are advertising and media uh, defining and working on this problem? So one area that I've been more interested in recently is the production side of ads. So the production of a creative itself, um, the, the use of materials there, the use of um, emissions from a travel perspective. So um, someone was talking to me about how you know, there was a, they ran, it's a European company, they ran a um, a commercial for, you know, an everyday household object. And of course, the the shoot was a what week long in South Africa, but it was in a, with a green screen. So you could have done it, you could have done it anywhere. Um, so I think thinking about the creative production um, world um, within media. So that's something that I think there are, again, really interesting ways of um, thinking about how to reduce and optimize um, emissions and waste there, that flows in, just extends the, the supply chain out. I think um, lots of work being done in that area in the industry as well. Yeah, is, is Green the Bid someone you're familiar with? Green the Bid, yeah, 
add green. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably the closest thing I've encountered that's really focused on the commercial production side of things. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I know that they're pushing for so many best practices, like um, you use a hard drive once and then you put it in cold storage and it has to be, you know, in a special place that is in a controlled environment that uses electricity. Um, can't you reuse those hard drives, for example? And lots of lots of work and thinking being done there and in, in that area of the industry too. I never would have thought of that, but that's a great, great point. Hey folks, this is the part of the show where we say thank you and see you soon to the general audience plus and higher tier members of Decarbonize.co. Stay tuned for the rest of the episode.